Action Group. I don't have notes to read by tonight, so I'm going to have to wing what I need to tell you. I'd like to start off by acknowledging that we're meeting on the land of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to their elders past and present. For those of you that don't know, Beyond Zero Emissions is a largely volunteer group whose passion is researching solutions to global warming and communicating those solutions. The monthly discussion group is uh, a forum where we have an interesting speaker come along and talk on something that is relevant to those aims. And tonight we have a particularly interesting speaker. Beyond Zero Emissions is a, as I said, a volunteer group. It's not allied with any business or politics, so it's run entirely on donations from the public. Uh, if you think that sounds like a good idea, we would certainly welcome your donations. Uh, we normally have a gold coin entry into this forum. Uh, I think what we might try and do is, uh, me, who organises this, hasn't shown up tonight inexplicably. Um, so I might sit my grotty lunchbox on a chair outside the door. Uh, <laughs> so without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor David Caroli from Melbourne University. Please welcome David. Thank you. Thanks, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, um, mainly because I had agreed to do one of these conversation discussion groups four months ago, I think, no, I think. <laughs> and at relatively short notice, got sick, had to cancel, and then Mima contacted me, she's persuasive, but I felt you know, on a bound to honour the commitment to talk and had expected 20 people. <laughs> BZE is flourishing, which is fantastic because I've been involved in discussions and supporting BZE since it was started now, six years ago? Something like that. And, you know, I don't do much work on mitigation on solutions for Australia. I do work on climate science, and so I'm going to talk much more about that, although there are some science implications for emission reduction strategies and technology. I'm not even going to talk about one of the other hats that I wear, which is as a member of the soon-to-be-extinct Climate Change Authority, although that might depend upon what Clive Palmer and Pup wants to do. <laughs> Uh, it's a little hard to judge what he thinks at any stage. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about climate change already. I'm going to talk about science. And Miwa asked me to talk about climate science, what's the latest information. And I started to think, well, you know, should I talk about this or that? And in the end, it's a bit of a smorgasbord. Many of you will be familiar with the IPCC assessment. I'm going to touch on a few things in the IPCC assessment from 2013, and then I'm going to talk about some new science, which is, I think, probably responding to a challenge from the Prime Minister um, and his uh, understanding of, or maybe it's misunderstanding <laughs> of the climate change science. There are some things that he says that are correct. You have to wait for them. <laughs> but let me start. What I'm going to do, talk a little bit about the IPCC, talk a little bit about impacts, and then I'm going to talk a lot more about extremes, and in particular, what we can say about observed changes in extremes in Australia, and in particular, extreme events that have occurred in Australia in 2013 and over the last few years. What can we say about the influence of human-caused climate change on these extreme events? And hopefully I can persuade you at the end to all be involved in a project which I'm running, a citizen science project. But that's jumping ahead, so... Okay... 
Ah. Here we go. Computer had gone to sleep and now it's woken up again. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about information from the IPCC. And many of you will have seen these diagrams before. But what I'm going to try to do is to use these diagrams to talk about some of the perceived controversies or uncertainties in terms of climate change. And not everything that I'm saying is written down, but this is a graph that shows actually three different estimates of global average temperatures, year-to-year -year variations from observations from 1850 right up to the present. And as Andrew Bolt or Alan Jones, those experts on climate science, tell us, there's been no warming either in the last 10 years or since 1998. And first of all, there has been an increasing trend. The trend is not negative, but it's certainly not significant. We wouldn't expect a 15-year trend over this period. The IPCC, in its assessment, said climate models do not show the small reduction in warming. I mean, if you look at this graph, you see a larger rate of warming there. And if you start over the last 15 years, from 1998, you get a reduced rate of warming. When they compared that to climate model simulations, as they do in what's called the technical summary, <coughs> the climate models, if you start in 1998, do not agree as well with the observed temperatures. <coughs> but that's a really bad piece of science. Because you've chosen in the real world to start at the strongest El Nino event in the last 100 years, and El Nino contributes two to three tenths of a degree, degree increase in global average temperatures. So it's not surprising that 1998 sticks up here, and it's not surprising that 2011 and 2012 are cold because they were in La Nina events or cold ocean temperatures. So if you choose a 15 year period that starts in an El Nino event and finishes in La Nina events, in other words, warm ocean temperatures, to start with cold ocean temperatures at the end, you've got an a posteriori choice of the period, which means you've chosen the period after it's happened. Really bad statistics to choose your period after it's happened. So if you just choose climate models and go from 1998 to 2012, 15 years, it's not surprising that it's um, not well simulated in the climate models because this is the strongest El Nino event in 100 years and this is the strongest La Nina event in 100 years. So what you've got to do is either remove the El Nino influence from the observations and from the climate models or choose climate model simulations which don't necessarily start in 1998, but start in a strong El Nino event and go for 15 years and coupled ocean atmosphere climate models that are used in the IPCC assessment <coughs> have natural variability. Coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere leads to the models to simulate El Ninos. So you can choose in the models to start an El Nino year. And when you do that, there's excellent agreement between the observed slowdown in the warming in the observations and a slowdown in warming when you start in an El Nino event in the climate model. And even better, when you let it run for 15 years or pick 15 year periods that finish in a La Nina event. In other words, if you choose 15 year periods starting in an El Nino, ending in a La Nina, much as in the observations, they agree perfectly with that. There was a paper in Nature Climate Change on that two weeks ago says that if you choose a better statistical analysis, there's no difference. In fact, the reason for this slowdown in warming is essentially the natural variability in the climate system and because a lot of heat has gone into <coughs> the oceans. I've done some analysis which shows that if you look at the next 15 years in models that have gone from an El Nino event to a La Nina event, you get pronounced acceleration in the warming. 
because you've started in a very cold period, and sure enough, you'd expect over the next 15 years an acceleration in the warming again. So, unfortunately, what is the saying? What comes around goes around. It may well come back and bite us, this heat that's being stored in the ocean, because we can see on land and in many other areas in the deep ocean that the ocean heat content has continued to increase. Most of the heat added to the climate system is going into the oceans. That's only one slide, and I've spent 15 minutes talking about it. I better speed up. I'm supposed to only last talk for half an hour. OK. Australian average temperatures. What's happened? Well, you've probably seen these graphs. It doesn't matter so much. But this is the annual average temperature for Australia. And I'm going to focus on 2013. 2013 was the hottest year in Australia. We've done some analysis which looks at how much of that was due to climate change or could this year have occurred just due to natural variability alone? Stay tuned. I'll tell you before the end. Greenhouse gases have increased dramatically. The concentrations, this is old, are now, depending on whether you pick the peak in the seasonal cycle or the long-term average, annual average last year around 397 parts per million unprecedented for at least 800,000 years. You can certainly get concentrations above 400 parts per million if you pick the peak in the seasonal cycle. Fortunately, and unfortunately, a large part of the carbon dioxide increase is not remaining in the atmosphere but actually being stored away in the oceans. That's actually an environmental service being provided by the oceans. Because if all the carbon dioxide we emitted stayed in the atmosphere, the increases would be even more rapid. The only problem is when carbon dioxide gets stored in the ocean, it increases the acidity. And here's the graph of acidity. Doesn't look like much. Over the last 20 years, the pH has fallen. And as Andrew Bolt regularly informs me, the ocean's not acid, it's alkaline, and he's quite right. If you look at the pH, it's alkaline, but it's becoming more acidic. pH is falling. These look tiny numbers. It's about 0.1 pH units. It's a logarithmic scale, log to the base 10. How big's 0.1 in a log to the base 10 scale? No, 0.1 in a log to the base 10 one. scale. What fractional increase? No, zero would be unity. So what fraction, what percentage change? So one unit on the pH scale would be a factor of 10. What is 0.1? It's not 10% because one would be 1,000%. Work it out. What's inverse log to the base 10 of 0.1? Work it out on your calculator. Or work it out on your iPad. Except they probably don't have inverse logarithms. You need an old-fashioned calculator. Turns out to be... So, a doubling is about 0.3. And 0.1 corresponds to about 30% increase in acidity. That means 30% more acidic ions in the water. And that's a large... Point one sounds tiny. 30% increase in acidity isn't big enough. Tiny. In a relatively small period. Projections of change. Okay. This is where we've been. Temperature variations over the last... 50 years or 60 years, this is where we're heading with a high emission scenario, the business as usual emission scenario. And this is the first time that the IPCC has looked at what's called a emissions stabilisation scenario or rapid mitigation action. And it looks like this scenario stabilises temperatures at only one degree of warming. Because on this scale, one degree is 
just here. That's one degree above 1995 levels. Because the zero here on this line turns out to be average on 1995. So how much warming was there between pre-industrial and 1995? About six to seven tenths of a degree. So you've got to add six to seven tenths of a degree to this, which puts it up here, which puts this line up here. This is the likely range. 66% probability, in other words, 80% <coughs> is above that, 18% is below here. 17%. What this means is that while there's, with this emission scenario, a reasonable chance, if it was possible to implement that scenario, a reasonable chance of staying, limiting global warming to less than 2 degrees, it's not a high confidence result. There's actually still more than 30% chance of global warming above 2 degrees, which is the level that's been assigned to dangerous climate change. So what has to happen with this scenario? Well, you go and look in the details of the IPCC assessment report. This scenario assumes negative net carbon dioxide emissions associated with industry and fossil fuel burn. Not positive, net negative emissions from industry and fossil fuel burn. By when? By 19, sorry, 80, uh, 2070. So that's globally. If Clive or Gina Reinhardt want to continue digging up coal and burning it, it will only be possible if there's effective, efficient and cheap and completely reliable carbon capture and storage. And if you believe that, you believe in fairies at the bottom of your garden. What about this scenario? Well, this scenario looks as though it's got a warming of four degrees. But remember, you've got to add seven tenths of a degree, so it's 4.7. And then this range looks as though it's up at about 5 point something in 2100, but if you look at it for the um, last <coughs> decade, it's 4.8 for the last decade of the period averaged. So one of the things that no one ever asked in the IPCC was the upper range of the high warming projections in the last IPCC assessment, high emission scenario, high warming scenario, was a warming of 6.4 degrees. This one looks as though it's 4.8 relative to the baseline of 2000. Why haven't the climate change sceptics said that IPCC projects 25% less warming? in 2100. Surely they'd be celebrating. We don't have as much to worry about. The IPCC in their summary for policymakers does not clearly explain why this level of warming, 4.8 for the 1990s, is 25% less than the last assessment. But there's a simple and clear reason. They've ignored one of the major sources of uncertainty, intentionally. And it's tough to understand why you would intentionally choose to ignore one of the major sources of uncertainty. But it's to do with the new emission scenarios. In the IPCC, this <coughs> assessment report, they use what are called representative concentration pathways for the emission scenarios which provides scenarios for the greenhouse gas concentrations from 2005 up to 2100 and further into the future as well. So that means they've tied or they've locked in the carbon dioxide concentration, methane concentration in the projections. Which means that if there's any impact of the warmer temperatures on the oceans, 
or on the land surface in terms of releasing extra carbon dioxide, that's not allowed in these scenarios. It's what? It is not, not allowed. allowed in these scenarios. In terms of... Be it could be. It is allowed in the mid-range estimate, but it's not allowed in the uncertainties. Great. If you go to the detailed assessment in the chapter, which no one looks at, it actually has models driven by emissions, not concentrations, including the carbon cycle feedback, which go back and show warming of 6.4 degrees by 2100. For some reason, the IPCC decided to show a smaller rate of warming because it was consistent with this emission scenario, but it's not the worst case, by a long way. 25% more warming due to carbon cycle feedback for high emissions. You could go and ask the chairman of the IPCC. I have no idea why. Um, I'm going to talk about extremes. I've already spent too much time. I can rattle on. Uh, we know with high confidence that there's going to be more hot extremes, fewer cold extremes, and more heavy rainfall events. I'm going to start to look at those because many of those are already happening. Apart from the IPCC miss communicating the magnitude of the warming, there's only one new thing in the IPCC phase of set. Sorry. There's lots of new information about observations and model simulations and things like that. There's only one new idea. And it's not even that new, but it's since the previous IPCC assessment. And that is that it's the cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that determine global temperature change. Because carbon dioxide has a very, very long residence time or removal time in the atmosphere, thousands of years for it to be removed, it's the cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide over a 100-year period or longer which will determine the temperature change. <coughs> That's what's shown here. It's cumulative emissions on this graph and temperature response on this graph. These different lines show what's happened here in the observations, here in different model simulations, and here's an uncertainty range. <coughs> that bottom line is that we can work out if we want to limit warming to 2 degrees with high confidence, how much carbon dioxide can be emitted? And there's some calculations here, and I'm not going to go through them. Bottom line is to have moderate confidence. It's a total of a billion tonnes of carbon in the form of CO2. So it's a billion tonnes of carbon that can be emitted over all of history, all of human history. And we've already emitted 515, and the number is reduced to 800 gigatons if you take into account the warming due to methane and nitrous oxide. So the difference between that and that is about 285. It's all that's left. 285 billion tonnes of carbon. Sounds like a lot, except Clive and Gina know that there's about somewhere between three and five times that amount of carbon in the coal that already exists in known reserves. And if that gets burned, as they would like, then we can't. Let me try to warm to two degrees. Best estimate is that something like 80 well, somewhere between 66 and 80% of the carbon existing carbon reserves in fossil fuels have to stay in the ground. That's what that diagram says. That's oil and coal. Oil and coal and natural gas. So unfortunately, we should be trying to keep stuff in the ground. This is that warming scenario 
projected out to 2050, that would be expected to leave warming below 2 degrees. Here's the business as usual warming scenario, and here's the emissions 20, 10, 11, and 12. Emissions did drop a little bit here, but not much. That was the global financial crisis. And then they rebounded really quickly, and emissions are continuing at a rate which is even higher than the worst case that the IPCC considered in this assessment report. But supposedly governments are trying to achieve this scenario. <laughs> you can already work out what the difference is between there and there. And what's needed is rapid global action, not just to slow down emissions, but to actually bring them substantially down to stabilise them. Because this scenario, although it has small increases until about 2020, in practice, Emissions from 2010 to 2020 are nearly constant. And as developing countries increase their emissions, it means developed countries need to reduce theirs. And it's not happening in Australia. I said I was going to talk about impact. Many of you will have seen this because this is looking at impact in Victoria from climate change. Impacts on projected reductions in rainfall, increases in fire weather, increases in very hot days, apart from this year, decline in snow cover, on average, increases in sea level. And if we look over the last 10 years, all of those are happening already. I've recently done some analysis of temperature change in Melbourne that was projected by CSIRO to happen for 2030 from 1990. So the projections were actually made in 2007. So this is based on the last IPCC assessment report. And they're about to release a new set of climate change projections. But we said, well, if you're going to release new projections, maybe we should look at how good the last lot were. The really interesting thing is we have already exceeded the best estimate of the warming in 2030 now in 2010. In the decade, for the most recent decade, we have already exceeded that rate of warming and we've also exceeded the best estimate for the increase in the number of days over 35 Celsius. So in Victoria, climate change is happening faster than CSIRO projections for 2030. We're already exceeding those changes. In 2013, there were a whole bunch of extreme events. Record temperatures in summer. Bushfires just to the west of Sydney in October. The Prime Minister got into an argument with the chairman of the UNFCCC and basically, here's one of these few sensible quotes which is that the CSIRO, amongst many other reputable scientific organisations, has cautioned about attributing any particular weather event to man-made climate change. And he's right, it's difficult. Some of the other things he says is that, quotes Dorothy McKellar, Australia is a land of droughts and flooding rains, it's all happened before, therefore what's happening now is no different from the past. So I decided myself and a group of other researchers, that we should look at this. Can we assess whether the chances of extreme events like summers of 2013 or wildfires, bushfires in west of Sydney, can be linked to human-caused climate change or are just part of natural variability? So that's what I'm going to talk about now. A method that we use for looking at whether there's been a change in risk. Now, we don't have enough observational data to look at this. We don't have 
lots and lots of repeated extreme events to see what the chances of them, because by definition, extreme events are rare. The only way we can look at the relative frequency of extreme events is use climate model simulations and run the climate model simulations, perhaps just with natural variability and then also run them again with natural variability and increasing greenhouse gases and other human influences on climate. So we've done that, looking at simulations that have been run by other groups. And what we look at is the change in probability or the change in risk. And this is a bit like looking at different causal factors. And it's, the methodology is borrowed from smoking and lung cancer, from medical epidemiology. Not everyone who smokes gets lung cancer. Not everyone who gets lung cancer smokes. But if you look at large populations of people, there is a strong link between increasing rates of smoking and increasing rates of lung cancer. So can we use the same approach to look at the relationship between extreme events like record high temperatures and increasing greenhouse gases, or natural variability like El Nino events? Well, this analysis was tried first looking at the European heat wave in 2003. This is the area average summer temperatures in Europe. Each one of those little lines is the temperature in Europe for a different summer. And here's 2003, two degrees warmer than the previous summertime average. It was a really unusual event. So what was done is look at the chances of this occurring, both in climate model simulations with just natural variations, and this is the number of occurrences per thousand years. And basically you get, it's a once in a thousand year event just due to natural variability. And then you run it and look at climate model simulations with increasing greenhouse gases. And it turns out that it ends up being, on average, best estimate, about four times in a thousand year event. So climate change has increased the risk by about a factor of four. Now, if you allow for uncertainties and the fact that there are some cases where you don't get a risk, an increase, and you look at what can we say with 90% confidence, being conservative as a scientist, we get about a doubling of the increase. What about when we do this for Australia? So, some of you may have seen this. It's a graphic <coughs> describing some of the extreme, extreme conditions that occurred in the summer of 2013. It's called the Angry Summer, or that name was coined by people in the Climate Commission before it died. <coughs> if you want the data or the reports, right at the end of my talk, and it's going to make it available on the BZE website, there's a reference to where you can get it. This website, climatecommission.gov.au, for some reason got closed <laughs> as soon as the new government got elected. So you can't get it at that site. But we had the hottest day averaged across Australia, the record hottest area average temperature for Australia, 40.3 degrees. Seven days in a row over 39 Celsius. Record temperatures in Sydney, 45.8 about half a degree warmer than the previous record. Record high temperature for Canberra. We didn't get a record high for Melbourne, but we did get the record hottest summer averaged across the whole of the country as well. So I said to a postdoctoral research fellow, we should look at this in climate models in much the same way as that 2003 event. This is the temperature variations and sure enough, 2003, sorry, 2013 was the hottest year. And the previous hottest was here in 1998. What else happened in 1998 that I talked about before? <laughs> it's an El Nino event. Typically, El Nino causes warmer temperatures in Australia associated with drier conditions. 
2013 was not an El Nino event. It was actually neutral. So, El Nino didn't contribute to this. But let's look at the different factors that might have contributed. So what we did was we used the global climate models. We extracted out the area average temperature over Australia from lots and lots of different climate models. And we looked at the distribution of annual, sorry, summer average temperatures. So we first assessed the model skill in representing the observed variability. And then we looked at the changes in the frequency of these very hot temperatures. And what we did is assess what was the chance of setting a new record, a temperature hotter than 1998? We're not going to look at the chances of getting that temperature. We're going to look at what's the chances of getting a temperature hotter than 1998. So, lots of climate model simulations, lots and lots of data. Historical simulations with increasing greenhouse gases up to the period 2005. Natural simulations that don't include human influences from multiple different climate models. Nine different models. I didn't run it, we just analysed the data. As well as future simulations. And we picked the period 2006 to 2020 because that's centred on 2013. 2013 is right in the middle of that period. Which means that essentially it's got the appropriate greenhouse gas concentrations and other human influences on climate. So, what do we get? Well, this is a comparison of the observed temperatures from 1911 to 2005 and the model simulations. They look pretty good. We've chosen models that simulate El Nino well. We've chosen models that do a good job of simulating the year-to-year -year variability. That's why we haven't used all the models. And what we're going to look at is what is the chance of exceeding this temperature in models with just natural variability? Remember, we're going to look at the exceeding 1998. So, here's the observations. That includes data right up to 2005. Here's now the model simulations, including increases in greenhouse gases and their response in the period 2006 to 2020. And you can see that there's a much larger probability, because this is a probability distribution, much larger probability under here compared with there. So, whoops, wait a sec, I didn't mean to do that, I didn't mean to do that. I'm not very good at animations. This is the simplest animation that I could make. But what it's showing is that as greenhouse gas increases occur, the observed temperatures go from here to here to here in turn. So not the observed, the model simulated temperatures shift in probability distribution, exactly as scientists have been saying. As more greenhouse gases, they move the whole distribution. And the best estimate is a nine times increase in risk up here, we're at 90% confidence of at least a five times increase in risk, in this case for 2013. We've also done the Australian area average temperature, same sort of analysis for the whole of 2013. That set a new record. And when you look at a longer time period, like an annual average rather than a summer average, the variability of the temperatures decreases. So what that means is we looked again at the climate models. We looked at climate model simulations just with natural variability. We found this was a once in six year event. The t annual temperatures in 2013 in climate models with increasing greenhouse gases for simulations in the period 2006 to 2020. And then we looked at all the model simulations we could find for the period from well, it doesn't really matter, 1850 to the present, but without any increases in greenhouse gases, as well as the unforced simulations, we looked at 12,500 years of model simulations, and there was one case in 12,500 years where that natural variability could cause the observed temperature as it occurred in 2005, which was the second warmest year. So, the conclusion is, it's virtually impossible in the models that we looked at for natural variability alone to cause climate change as we saw in the extreme temperatures in 2013.
Natural variability can't explain those record temperatures. Right. So, I've talked about area average temperatures using global climate models. But people aren't really interested in area average temperatures across Australia. If you want to know about a heat wave, it's what affects you locally in one city on one day or a few days. But global climate models have too coarse spatial resolution to be able to represent local scale variability. So I got involved in a project called Weather at Home, which does regional climate model simulations in different regions of the Earth, Western North America, Europe and South Africa. And I said to the people involved in Weather at Home, I think Australia would be a perfect site to run these regional climate model simulations and collect daily data. And so we set about launching the Weather at Home ANZ project for Australia and New Zealand. These fly specs are actually people's computers that have been involved in running these Weather at Home simulations prior to the launch of the Weather at Home ANZ project. So it's a partnership between the University of Oxford, researchers at the New Zealand National Institute for Water and the Atmosphere, and University of Melbourne and the University of Tasmania. We run initially simulations just for 2013, but we'll go back for other years as well. It uses a 50 kilometre by 50 kilometre grid over the whole of Australia. We look at simulations with observed greenhouse gases in 2013, observed sea surface temperature patterns, and then we look at another world, parallel simulations, for which we've removed the human-caused increases in greenhouse gases and we've removed the human-caused pattern of sea surface temperature increase. It's now, I've lost count of days, weeks, months, but I think it's five months since it was launched. No, four months since it was launched. And we've had, to put a little bit of a hold on it so we could process enough of the data, we've had 30,000 years of daily data return. This is run on people's home computers. Anyone can subscribe and run these simulations on their home computer. To run on each personal computer individually, and you return the results, it takes about a week or two to run the simulation and return the data. And if you're interested, we'd love you to get involved. Website's at the end of the presentation, or it's up here, climateprediction.net, whether at home, or there's another one at the end. So, what do these climate models do? Well, they run on your PC. Here's a little display of the simulation and it's running. This is a cloud map showing clouds are simulated. This is a weather map and uh, the colours of the grey shading is <coughs> rainfall. Looks just like a weather map. Looks so much like a weather map that we can do an animation. Pressure fields and rainfall. You can see the cold fronts coming across. This is a summertime simulation. We also get lots of tropical cyclone like vortices and unfortunately Townsville just got wiped out in that one. You can also see these heavy rain events. Some of them come through like this one. Oops. It's going to hit through New Zealand. This model unfortunately produces a few too many tropical cyclone like vortices but we can look at the data in these simulations. We can look at lots of different locations to evaluate it. We decided to look at a place that wasn't on the coast. <coughs> we looked at Canberra. This is the range of maximum temperatures in summer in Canberra. Very big range, but the model and the observations agree really well. And the same for rainfall. It's not perfect, but there's very good agreement. We've now got preliminary results, and we've done it for the Sydney record temperature. But what I'm going to talk about is that record temperature for the whole of Australia because we can compare the results from the global climate models and from this new weather at home. What do we get? Well, you may not be able to see the numbers. 
We have a quarter of a million January days of simulated response to increasing greenhouse gases. And half a million days in January without any increase in greenhouse gases, without any natural cause. And we can compare the frequency. And when we do that, these are the probability distributions, this is the threshold. You can see there's a marked increase in frequency. And the increase in risk is about a factor of six. And in other words, we can say that that record hottest day in Australia was made six times more likely due to anthropogenic climate change. That's what the Prime Minister said we couldn't do. Admittedly, we haven't written it up completely yet. It hasn't been published, but it will be. And we're also going to do it for a single day at a single location. We can do that as well. The interesting thing is five years and 35 different climate modelling centres contributed to the IPCC assessment. And they only produced 22,000 natural days averaged over Australia, whereas in three months we were able to get half a million days of temperatures over Australia. This citizen science project has been enormously productive in terms of generating climate model data. So, I've rambled, I've taken too long. What I've tried to do is talk about, in this, some exciting new science that we can do in terms of attribution of extremes. But I've also tried to give you an insight into what's happening with the latest science and some of the limitations in interpreting the IPCC assessment. I'm happy to answer lots of questions. These were the references that I said I would provide to you. So, thank you very much. Happy to answer questions. I'm going to start. Anyone in the back? No. Yeah. <coughs> Go for it. Um, would you like to comment on the recent discussion regarding the, um, the, the so-called leak alleged leak papers in the, the other the other weeks? Yeah. yeah. Um, look, I'm not an expert on pingos, which is supposedly the name of. <coughs> that sort of thing, but it appears to be associated with melting permafrost then allowing the natural gas or methane to escape. Um, there seem to be marked increases in methane concentrations associated with them, but I'm not an expert. It doesn't necessarily imply runaway methane release. But a lot more work needs to be done to understand. It certainly is an indication that melting in high latitudes of Eurasia is happening quickly at times and that it has an impact on permafrost natural ecosystems and we've been seeing that in Alaska and other high latitude regions for a long time. Down here. Um, thank you for the talk, Wendell. The, I was interested in your discussion of the can people hear me of the um, carbon budget, um, and particularly in the light of um, David Spratt's recent paper and presentation of Breakthrough. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. But basically, this concept of say roughly um, a thousand gigatons is it, and we've done 500 odd. Take out the other greenhouse gases, and I think you came out with 285 left as a nominal budget. But David Spratt's arguing very strongly that that's for uh, say one in two or a two in three chance of holding to yep. two degrees or something. If you go along the probability curve and say, well, instead of one in a million chance like we want for a plane, we only want a nine in ten chance of yep. not exceeding that, then we've already blown our budget. We have to stop instantly. Could you comment on your views on that? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> How do we get around it? Well, we need BZE or zero carbon Australia plans 
to be implemented very quickly. Yeah. As you know, beyond zero emissions really does mean we've got to have negative emissions. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned the methane release with melting the permafrost. Are there other positive feedbacks, such as the change in albedo and polar ice and so on, are they factored into your worst case scenario that you showed us earlier on, or are these even more alarming than your um, So the melting of ice is included. But the role of, for instance, um, methane release from melting of permafrost is not because those were concentration-driven emission scenarios. And remember I said that the feedbacks on the carbon cycle, including methane release, has not been factored in into those model simulations that were in the summary for policymakers. If you factor those in, admittedly quite crudely, then you get back to six degrees of warming above 1990 levels or nearly seven degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels with still quite high probabilities. So that's a different planet. The planet hasn't been seven degrees of warmer for hundreds of millions of years. It's a cool place. Yeah, you've had one go, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. The article in the ACE this morning mentioned that the trade winds were 50% stronger than what they had been historically. That sounds an enormous change. Yeah, um, so I don't know how many people have seen this article, but uh, what some scientists from the University of New South Wales had been looking at was, again, related to this slow down in the rate of atmospheric warming over the oceans, but an increase in the ocean heat uptake, and particularly associated with this shift from El Niño to La Niña. But what they also found in that period is there'd been a large observed increase in the trade winds over the Pacific Ocean, particularly the equatorial Pacific Ocean. And as you said, they're reporting a 50% increase. And they're now reporting that climate model simulations seem to be able to simulate this increase due to changes in ocean temperatures in the Atlantic Ocean, the equatorial Atlantic Ocean. And that then changes the overall circulation pattern. It's a little bit like El Niño. El Niño sea surface temperatures change the east-west circulation in the atmosphere over the Pacific. <coughs> Changes in ocean temperatures in the equatorial Atlantic can change the wind patterns over the Pacific. And that's what they're arguing. It's consistent with climate change and warming in the Atlantic. I haven't been able to have a chance to look at the details of the paper yet. But you're right, it appears to be a large change. Um, after those erudite questions in your even more erudite delivery, I'm going to ask a very simple question which goes to my personal crusade of trying to convert some people to the difference between climate and weather because clearly it's very hard to argue at the moment that we're on a, an increasing trajectory when we've just had an unusually cold spot. <coughs> You're absolutely right, and you know, <coughs> yesterday in the morning, this morning, whatever it was, Saturday morning, were both, or all of them were cold days, and we got the coldest day in 16 years. But it wasn't a record cold day. If we look at weather and its variability, one of the nice things we can do in looking at these extreme temperatures or natural variability, we can look at what is happening to these distributions. And what we find is, yeah, weather continues. You can still get cold extremes superimposed upon climate change or climate change superimposed on the natural variability. If the range of temperatures in... <coughs> let me see if I can get back to this one. This is the range of temperatures... 
driving across Australia, it's five degrees. In the natural simulations and in the anthropogenically forced ones. If the warming is one degree, it shifts it, and you can see that shift in the red curve, but it still means that you can get, even in the, and it's hidden behind you, you can still get cold years down here. And cold days. And at single stations, cold temperatures. So yes, natural variability <coughs> still occurs, it's still really important, but the chances of those record cold temperatures has decreased in most parts of the world. The frequency of very cold days, record cold temperatures, has decreased. And so when we compare frequency of record highs, maximum temperatures, new records, versus record lows, the ratio of those is about 5 to 1 in Australia over the last 10 years. Five times more record highs than record lows. But you can still get cold days. Uh, David, um, the viticultural industry has uh, found an old progress. Uh, you moved about 150k uh, south. Uh, the cold days we've had are huge highs, which I haven't seen highs like that come through in winter. Uh, so, could you just comment, has the weather pattern shifted down south so we're getting highs which give us cold weather in winter because it's nice and clear? Um, so, we've typically had occasional high pressure systems, but typically the weather systems in winter are cold fronts passing through and bringing rain both to Western Australia and to much of southeastern Australia, Victoria and South Australia. There has been marked declines in the frequency of these cold fronts and low pressure systems in wintertime affecting southern Australia. And that has been linked to climate change through increasing greenhouse gases, as well as changes in the circulation due to ozone depletion. And what it means is the high pressure belt has strengthened, moved a little bit south, and the rain that normally fell on Victoria is now falling on the ocean. It's not not raining, it's just not raining where the farmers can use it. So that has a major impact on agriculture. There was a paper that came out, high resolution climate modelling study of South and Western Australia, high resolution modelling, showed better than any other simulation that clear evidence that the changes in rainfall in southwest Western Australia and Victoria, primarily due to increasing greenhouse gases and therefore leading to reductions in wintertime rain due to reductions in the cold fronts and low pressure systems, particularly in winter. So yeah, what you've observed is correct. They have happened before, high pressure systems, just not as much. There's got to be a woman who's going to ask a question. It's only guys. <laughs> Thank you. Um, early on in the discussions about climate change, there was a lot of mention made about changing ocean patterns, particularly, I think it's called the conveyor, which takes the Arctic currents up through the Caribbean across to um, Europe. Um, we don't hear anything about that. Is that because this is not happening, or what can you say about that? Um, so, what you're describing is a large scale pattern of ocean circulation in the deep ocean that transfers heat between the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere, particularly in the Atlantic Ocean. And sometimes people get confused between the Gulf Stream and this deeper, what's called thermohaline circulation. And one of the reasons it got popular was because of a movie, The Day After Tomorrow. <coughs> I used to get my students to write essays on what was scientifically correct in that movie. It was a very short essay. Um, I don't do that anymore because the movie must be a decade old or something. But 
So, there's not as much discussion because, yes, there is still concern about the thermohaline circulation, but it appears unlikely to collapse. At least half the heat transport in the North Atlantic from the tropical Atlantic into Western Europe is associated with the wind-driven current, not the deep thermohaline current. And so we expect that that wind pattern, it's not driven by deep ocean circulation, it's driven by the normal west-to-east -east winds in the northern hemisphere. So that Gulf Stream current and typical currents up the west coast of most ocean basins or southward current in west coast of Australia is driven by the large-scale wind patterns. So it's unlikely to collapse. Um, this is really more inviting a comment. I feel that one of the problems in communicating with the broader public is that climate messages, climate change messages are quite complicated. And one thing that seems to me unnecessarily complicated in some ways is that the, the temperature change is shown as an anomaly a lot of the time around the late 20th century average. And I'm sure people would understand it so much better even if it was just a 100-year graph of, started from you know, where it was in the early 19th century. Can you comment on that or is it, more, is it possible to get that message out a bit more? Um, it is, but it's actually quite difficult. And that is because when we prepare the data from different locations, to prepare an accurate average across the whole globe, it's much more robust if you calculate the average as the average of the departures, the anomalies, at each location from the long-term average at that location and then average the anomalies at each location. And that's because, if you think about it, there's a massive temperature gradient between the tropics and the polar regions. There's also a massive temperature gradient with elevation, the high altitude places. So how would you calculate an accurate estimate when you're trying to calculate the temperatures at the top of Mount Hotham with Melbourne temperatures? When the temperature at the top of Mount Hotham, what area do you use for it to represent? Turns out the spatial anomalies in temperature are much more coherent. So we get much more robust estimates. Now we could add back in the mean global average temperature for some period or for the averaging period and then get a temperature it will look pretty boring it's going to look like 15 degrees going up to 16 degrees mm. but if it was started just the increase oh you could ease local data because people also respond more to local data yeah. i think so maybe there was more of that kind of you know what's happened in your locality on sure. the years. yeah one of the difficulties is although I didn't talk about it so much, and I'm not sure that I'll be able to get to it fairly quickly, is that as you go to lo more local data, it's harder and harder to see the trend. And this is the Australian temperatures. The variability of Australian temperatures from year to year is up and down about half a degree. It's about a one degree range. So here from one year to the next. Yeah, but that line, which is presumably the actual... This is the average. That's what looks like something... Sure, but that's Australian average. Mm -hmm. If you do it for Melbourne, it's really hard to see. There is a warming trend, but it's much more variability. Mm -hmm. Keith. Um, there's been quite a bit of talk about the increased melting of glaciers in the Antarctic recently, and the word irreversible has been used. Do you care to comment on that? Sure. There are lots of places to start. Let me talk as much as I know. And remember, I'm not an Antarctic ice expert. But what's critically important for sea level rise is melting of ice on land that's grounded that's resting on land even though the ice might be in the water if it's resting on the land you know 100 meters below the surface of the ocean it's still grounded 
Much of the ice shelves in certain areas around Antarctica is exposed to ocean water. And there's been a, over the last tens of thousands of years, increase in, well, changes in snow and then progression of glaciers down. But what's happened recently is the warming temperatures in the ocean waters, not the atmospheric temperatures, but in the ocean waters, have started to melt the ice in the ice sheets and the glaciers below the surface of the ocean. That's then freeing up the glaciers and the ice sheets to move because they're melting where they've been grounded. That is a bit like putting oil under something and they start to move much more rapidly. The point that was being made in these commentaries about irreversibility is that once they start to move, they don't slow down. Well, the only way they slow down is the next ice age. And that's not in my lifetime or anyone's lifetime here. So, you know, the m amount of sea level rise in the West Antarctic ice sheet is very large. The amount of sea level rise in Greenland is six or seven metres, I think, in the West Antarctic ice sheet. Yeah, again, six or seven metres. Total in Antarctica, 70. Well, roughly. So, once the West Antarctic ice sheet goes, of course, eventually the whole of Antarctica is going to go. The models are very, very uncertain. I had a graph of sea level rise and I took it out. Even under the lowest warming scenario, that one that stabilises temperatures at 2 degrees by 2050, <coughs> sea level rise, even in this scenario, keeps on rising for the next 300 years or more. Second question. But who's keeping um, count? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've heard sort of odd comments about the IPCC um, in, in, in accuracy in what they covered, but what you said tonight horrified me. I did also hear you say you don't know why, but it would seem to me you'd be probably one of the best people in Australia to have a good guess at why. Yeah. What do you think, or can't you say? What you think no, 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 I'm happy to say, even if it's being recorded, that's fine. I mean, I'm not involved in the Working Group 1 report. I mean, there are sound scientific reasons for what they did. They used these greenhouse gas concentration scenarios to drive the models and they say in their summary that these are the temperature projections and the uncertainties. These are the temperature projections and their uncertainties associated with those model simulations. What they don't say is actually there's another group of models that take into account carbon cycle feedbacks that show substantially more warming. <coughs> I have no idea why they didn't do that, but my guess is there was a political decision influenced by some governments to provide the highest confidence results, not results from a smaller number of models. And there aren't as many of these what are called Earth system models with coupled carbon cycle as well as coupled ocean and atmosphere and ice and everything. So they chose high confidence, robust results rather than maybe a risk-based assessment, which is present the information about what might be the worst case. Why? That's being politically conservative. And in fact, typically the IPCC has been very scientifically conservative. Too much it's typically underestimated the projected changes and the impacts in each of their assessments. So the next one comes out and said, actually, it's been worse in many of the impacts. Some of our councils have put restrictions on building permits to be so much above sea level or so far in on that. Earth. Is it realistic comment at this stage? Is this realistic proportion at this stage? Um, so it depends on where you're talking about. Um, Ipswich, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I was going to say there's not much point in the Carlton Council 
putting a, a restriction. Melbourne University isn't going to be a beachside university for a long time. But there is already significant coastal erosion in the Gippsland Lakes areas <coughs> and sea level rise is already having a major impact both in eastern Victoria and Gippsland and in the Western District in Portland and Port Ferry and Warrnambool. So, is it sensible? Well, in terms of planning restrictions, the question is, should you be allowing the developers to make money and sell property without worrying about whether the house might be <coughs> washed away in 20 years? Or is it sensible to provide a risk-based assessment that says there's a significant increasing risk of coastal erosion and storm surge in coastal erosion is already dramatically increasing the frequency of one in a hundred year events. One in a hundred year just means on average it'll happen once every hundred years. But it can happen, you know, at any stage. So the impact of, for instance, sea level rise on Hurricane Sandy and the sea level inundation in Manhattan was higher than the worst case that they projected for sea level rise and storm surge for 2070 in Manhattan. They had painted lines on the roads, well, on footpaths, to mark where would be the expected worst case. And Hurricane Sandy, inundation, flooding, was higher than that. So, and the question is, should we let the developers decide where they want to build or should there be controls, limits? My argument would be, if I was investing in a property or buying a property, I'd prefer that it was still standing in 50 years' time, not washed away, because the developer took his money and ran. But there is already very good assessments about coastal risk and increases in storm surge and sea level rise in many parts of Australia, and the, in the risk is dramatically increasing. Uh, with regards to the angry summer, so, and, and it's what we presented this evening, what type of angry summers would we expect over the next 10 years? <laughs> next 10 years, or? So, 50 years? Well, so let's talk about 10 years. We, you know, because we looked at 2006 to 2020, the 2013 year was a one in six year event. So we'd expect that year to become, you know, again before the end of the 2020s. Much the same sort of thing with the angry summer of 2013. Um, we'll be looking at further into the future. We've started to do that looking at the climate model simulations. They become normal events before 2050, one in two. And we're also looking at frequency of the extreme bushfire conditions, and those are also increasing dramatically. If an El Nino event uh, that, uh, develops this coming year, what effect would that have on the next year's summer? Or the coming summer, um, it'll be hotter, it'll be drier, and it'll be unpleasant. Uh, there'll be more bushfires, there'll be likely, likely deaths associated with heat stress, it'll be a very serious condition. Remember that the major heat waves we've had in 2009 or 2013 weren't associated with all the new events. 1998 or 2003 were hot years associated with all the new events. So I don't know if that's something to look forward to or something to fear, but unfortunately I don't have many good news stories, except you guys. I mean, you know how to fix the problem and are working hard to do that. So keep up the good work. Go ahead. Hey, go on. Yes, so I was just wondering, I mean, we're, the only way to get a good news story in climate 
is to do is to change the trajectory so dramatically that you actually stop a lot of the projected events in the short term. The only way you can do that is with zero emissions and the drawdown, and you might have to look at you know, solar activity. But it seems to me it's very hard to get people motivated to make the, the, the extremity of the changes we need to make quickly, unless we can actually hold out a more positive vision. Because otherwise, really yeah. what we're saying is choose between you know unmitigated disaster and just total, absolutely unbelievable disaster. And that's not terribly inspiring. So I'm wondering at what point we decide we've made a mistake with our model for solving the problem and recalibrate it and start to pitch across the country and across the world the yep. kind of thing that BZE is talking about, yep. but actually bringing the science story that relates to that and the technology change and the social change, get people working on all three of those elements, yep. not necessarily the same people doing each thing, but get them kind of coordinated a bit more so that they actually hang together. Um. Can Compl I just sharpen his question a little bit? S certainly. What, uh, is it um, irresponsible to suggest that the academics in the university get out of their ivory tower and then be heard a bit more? Um, no, that's not irresponsible at all, and I, I try that as, as often as I can and speak to lots and lots of different groups. But it's tough to do that to groups that have already made up their mind. And so I've never been invited to speak to the Liberal Party. Um, and there are lots of reasons about that. I do speak to lots and lots of different groups, you know, school groups, business groups, things like that. Uh, it's, you know, in terms of the solution, I mean, you're absolutely right. There needs to be dramatic transformation in the society if we're going to avoid this and bring that back down here. And it's only by doing that that you dramatically reduce the risk. Uh, you know, I, I don't have any solution for that. I... I <coughs> bang on my table, I give as many talks as I can, I try, but you're right, we need to mobilise. Um, I would still argue that we need to represent scientifically responsible or plausible scenarios, but unfortunately what we need is the dramatic change that will likely eventuate in the next five to ten years from the realisation that Australia's investment in coal and gas is extremely short-sighted because there isn't a market and that if 80% of the coal has to stay in the ground it means that all the assets in coal in many of the coal mining companies and in particular even in BHP in their coal mining investments is overvalued because if 80% has to stay in the ground the value of the rest of it will dramatically there, there fall because no, there is no 80% if you mm. oh. if you apply safety standards the yeah. standard in industry like if the, the absolutely worst standards in, in normal engineering would yeah. be a 1 in 1,000 or 1 in 10,000 chance of failure the IPCC is talking about a, a 1 in 3 chance That's correct. of failure yep and when, when we were talking about the 90% yep. kind of thing, that's only a 1 in 10 chance of failure, which is actually, it, it's worse than anything that would ever be accepted in normal engineering for, yep. for building trams and bridges yes. and hard disk drives and medical equipment and anything you care to know yep. in normal life. Why are we still applying non-safe things to our planet? Why, why do we perpetuate that model? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And the answer is it's the government's that determine, if you like, the scope of the IPCC. No, it's not. You know that. It's the scientists because no, no. They take what if you had a if you had a bunch of scientists. Oh, absolutely. We are going to use safety standards that are stock standard regular in industry. Yeah. We apply for that, and we start producing scenarios. We produce papers and we publish it. 
there would be a debate, but there's nothing there. Christian had started in something in, nine, in you know, like 10 years ago. Uh, the, Ken Caldera does a bit of stuff, you know, Matthews and Coke. But most of the climate scientists won't touch any of these scenarios with a 10 foot barge pole. Yeah, but one of your risks, one of your categories is tangible, like the tram crashing or plane crashing. Climate change is still seen by, dare I say, the vast swathe of the public as something that might or might not happen. No, but the, the, so, same, the same problem so, would apply to safety standards with trams if we took your model, which is, you know, ask the public. What happens is that the, the people, the engineers and the safety experts, worked out what's good for trams. And they say to the public, we'll put in place a good standard that means you can get on a train without crashing all the time. So it's actually the experts who have to lead on this stuff. It's not something that you should really expect the average person to be getting their head around. No, I, I agree with that in terms of you don't want the average person. But if the you know funding agencies or governments, in terms of you know most of the climate modelling efforts are done through government funded labs because you can't do this sort of research. Could we fund you to do it? Uh, you might be able to fund multi mine chowsen, but it's a. Uh... No, but could we? If, if we raise some money, could we fund people to actually do some of those? Yeah, yeah. so certainly multi could do these sorts of things with his simple model, and it's a model that's been, you know, tuned to do it. You know, it's not an area that I'm working on, but it is very much an area that others here at the University of Melbourne are working on. And we have now a new sort of graduate college focused on climate and energy transitions <coughs> with a bunch of really capable graduate students who are likely to be quite interested in some of these challenges. So yeah, I think it's a great suggestion. It probably wouldn't require much money to get a graduate student to run this Graduate students are cheap. <laughs> um, without wanting to sound too bloodless, the, any, anybody who is a student of history knows that crisis creates change. And when the, the drought of the 90s ended, I'm my belief is a lot of people, a bit like the, the Y2K computer bug, said, well, that was a load of bullshit. <laughs> and, and it's only when we do have a, an El Nino effect, combined with all of the other things that are going, or a, or a Hurricane Sandy, that people actually get it into their heads that these are not high-in-the-sky predictions, that they're the actuality of their future. Um, I agree, but I don't like either recommending that we wait for no, the next disaster. I'm, I'm not suggesting that, but that's, that is going to be what is going to drive real change. Um, it's real crisis. Potentially. The really interesting thing is that I thought, and a number of other scientists thought, that, you know, major climate-related crises, like the Black Saturday bushfires, would draw attention to the increasing risk. And unfortunately, the Royal Commission on the bushfires decided that climate change didn't exist and redefined the English word unprecedented. Because the word unprecedented usually means has not occurred before, and that was what the climate conditions were like on that day. But because there had been bushfires previously, therefore bushfires were not unprecedented. Yeah. Which is an interesting... And they refused to consider climate change as a factor. And part of the logic behind that, I found out, is because they did not want there to be a get-out clause for some of the potential liable companies for them to say it was primarily an act of God. <coughs> or, in practice, an act of... Gina Reinhardt and Clive Palmer in terms of coal mining. Yeah. We are looking at liability and changes in risk. Yeah. I think what we've got quits there. We're supposed to be out of here at 8 o'clock. Uh, thank you all for turning up. Would you please put your hands together for...
uh, this that uh, we owe these rooms the University of Melbourne for letting us use this room and it's part of our research um, partnership with the Energy Institute of Melbourne University that uh, leads us to get this room. Uh, Mayor was going to stand outside with a box to collect your uh, gold point exit. If you can manage that, that'd be great. Uh, but we are going to have room on the first Monday of next month, and it will be to do with activism around the state election.